honor to be here. I'm sorry I won't be able to spend the next uh, two days. I was looking forward to it. And uh, the topic I was asked to talk about was leading culture and innovation. Um, basically, for me, it's like summing up my life in 20 minutes, which I've never done before. So we'll see how that goes. And um, this is my personal observations. Uh, it's not a methodology. It's based on my life experience. A lot of it in printing industry, 27 years, if I count 25 in Indigo and now two years in Hikon. Um, but honestly, it's more from just uh, from life, from reading books as a child, from playing music, from gardening. And at the end, yes, I'm not a big reader of business books, but there are books that I've seen through the years, which at the end I sort of said, wow, that makes sense. That's sort of what I'm thinking. So I'm, I'm going to leave you hopefully with a few models or books, if you're interested, to read, which might be relevant and interesting. But again, specifically, um, I, I do want to share my observations from within the printing industry, but also from outside. Before I joined uh, Indigo in 1995, um, I was in the chemical industry for 10 years. I was in the uh, uh, Bank of Israel. I was in the army for a few years, like all Israelis. And for the last two years, I've been doing totally different things, really dealing with companies that are trying to innovate either within the graphic industry, like, like Icon, but also in the textile industry, plastic industry, and alternative plant-based meat among others, and quite a little work around um, other, I would say, social entrepreneurship, which has always uh, fascinated me. Um, I do want to say one thing before I jump in, and uh, this also relates a little to my family, which you'll sort of, we'll see comes up as a theme. Um, I, I don't think any forum today can sort of just continue business as usual. We're faced in a situation in the world and in Europe specifically where we have a war. We have an invasion of Russia into the Ukraine. It's a horrible thing. My two uh, grandparents here on the picture in 1918 were both fighting literally each other in the Eastern Front. My grandfather on the right in the Russian army of the Tsar and on the left of the Kaiser army in Germany. They both uh, survived. They both became medical doctors, both moved to Berlin, and both left in 1933 when Hitler came to power and they couldn't really practice as doctors anymore. So for me, as somebody that was born in Israel but has this European heritage, this whole notion of war in Europe again is horrible. And we as a printing industry need to do, we have to do something about it. There is an organization which I'm trying to help as I can called Print Against War. You can just Google it. I know some of you are already involved. And we're trying to con remain in contact with the uh, with, uh, printers uh, and converters in the Ukraine. I was in Finnet a few weeks ago, and one of the speakers who has an organization, actually has a company in the Ukraine, stood up and talked a little bit about what it means for his employees, etc. And he said a sentence which really struck me. He said, at this time, humanism is the most important thing. And he meant to say it's more important than profit or you know all these other things. And uh, actually, I, I, I think that's true. But I think, uh, by the way, it's true not only now. It's always true. And maybe some of these things will come up through my presentation. So really, I encourage you to take a little bit of time to, to look at this site. Before I dig into some of my observations, I want to sort of share my, my thinking in terms of frame. At the end, you know, my father now is close to 97, and he was born in 1925. There were 2 billion people on this planet. Today, they're close to 8. This is crazy. I mean, this is unprecedented what's happened over the last few decades. In, in the lifetimes of many of us, the population has doubled from four to eight, and it will flatten out. But this, for me, is the fundamental, most important change which drives everything for every industry, including printing. And together with that, we've seen an unprecedented boom in uh, technology, which is really amazing. And it has a lot of great things because it's elevated the standard of living and the number of people living in poverty and starving and life expectancy has grown. There are a lot of great, great things about that. Um, but there's also horrible things about that. And uh, as a print industry, we, we get a lot of flack. Even in the paper industry, all these sentences flying around, even in a company like HP, where you, on many people's email it says, please don't print this if you don't have to which is, for me, really over-apologetic. Of course, the converting industry in plastic, it's a more complicated story. But now we're involved in the meat industry. And you can see here the impact of beef on CO2 emissions. So beef is 4.3 uh, CO2 equivalent gigatons. 
which is five times more than all air travel, right? So we say we flew over here, we feel bad. This is by far the worst thing for the planet. On the other hand, this is just one example. Textile is a horribly polluting industry. Plastics is a horribly polluting industry. So I, I think you know, the reality is we're in a terrible situation in the world. The reality also is that as a print industry, we have to do things about this because otherwise you know, we not only impact the world, we also are going to get ourselves in trouble, certainly on the plastic side. Uh, but we also have to take this into proportion. I don't think we have to be over apologetic. We have to be smart. We have to be proactive. But this is, for me, a, a, a critical background for everything. And I'm, I'm glad that in the next two days, there's also a lot of discussions on sustainability. Back to my experience in the print industry. I, I joined Indigo in 1995. Indigo was a startup. I came in with a financial role after Drupa in 95, which was a huge success. And very quickly, we sort of hit a brick wall. Uh, customers weren't that satisfied. The presses didn't really work. Nobody really knew what to do with them. We ran out of money. It was a few difficult years. In 2002, HP acquired us. And by 2004, we were again stuck in a wall. Not, not easy transition from an independent Israeli publicly traded company to part of a corporate giant. And in 2004, I assumed the role of general manager. And this is one of the first slides I, I showed employees, partners, customers. And this was a picture I took of my son uh, somewhere in, in southern, in, I don't remember if it's southern France or northern uh, Spain. And, and for me, this was sort of the challenge we had as Indigo. We were like $200 million business, losing a lot of money. And the vision of the management team, who have, you know, Simon, Francois, who are eventually part of this team, we said, we're going to become a billion dollar business. We're going to be the leading vendor of printing in the digital uh, era, in the digital period. We're going to lead this transformation. And everybody said, hey, you've been around for nine years. You haven't really succeeded. Many people in HP asked, when will you shut us down? And certainly, there was a big, fo a big push to only focus on one thing, commercial print. Forget labels, forget photo, forget web to print, forget packaging. It's not important. And we sort of said we had a vision, we had a mission. But this was, for me, the picture. My little son trying to push this big thing, getting to a billion uh, dollars. And eventually, we got to a billion dollars. It took a little bit more than we wanted to, but launched Series 3. And we got at the end, in, uh, after the big crisis of 2008, 2009, won't get into all to that. And through the years, as we grew, I started feeling more and more, I used to call it gravity, that as we're growing and pushing, we're actually getting very complicated, and it's becoming very difficult to sustain this customer intimacy, this innovation, this passion. And um, then I sort of came upon a model called the Founder's Mentality. If you Google it, you'll see there's a 15-minute video. It's a Bain model. For me, it's fascinating. And there they don't call it gravity. They call it the westward winds. And just to explain this little chart, Indigo in 1995, also in 2004, was an insurgent. The incumbents were Heidelberg, Roland, KBA, Komori, et cetera, et cetera, right? The incumbents in the printing industry were R.R. R. Donnelly, Quebecor, Quad, et cetera, right? And we were little insurgents. We had like bold ideas, we had an amazing technology, we had the passion, we had no scale. On the other hand, you had the incumbents, and what you really want to do, you want to be a company that has this passion, this, this uh, technology, this amazing culture, but that scales. Unfortunately, most companies, as they scale, they become struggling bureaucracies. So you're moving sort of up there to the top left instead of moving purely up. And this is a daily fight of how to avoid this and how to all the time continue to innovate, continue to be agile, continue to delight your customers, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the printing industry over the last 20, 25 years, so many of the incumbents have disappeared in terms of the vendors. And look at the insurgents that have been created, right? Shutterfly on the photo, Simpress on the web to print, um, you know, the little J's of this world or Rakos of this world on the labels that were nothing and became, you know, pretty big uh, players. Uh, EPAC on the flexible packaging, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, the, the real beauty of the packaging and printing industry, which I appreciate now even more than ever, is the fact that at the end, despite the massive consolidation of the last 
few decades, which will continue. It's at the end a family-driven kind of business. And even when you have massive companies with plants, the good companies sort of keep themselves small with a lot of agility and innovation. And people know what they're doing. It's not this corporate environment that people come in every three years, change, uh, change their role, and never really go, go deep. And I, I probably learned more from my interactions with the hundreds and hundreds of Indigo customers through the years, those that succeeded and those that failed and those that disappeared than any other school I could have ever, ever asked for. So how do you, you know, for me, how do you sort of become an insurgent, and then how do you scale insurgencies? Of course, you need a vision. You need a very bold vision. Uh, again, Indigo's vision in the 90s, which was defined by Benny Landa, was not just that everything that could become digital will become digital, but that actually Indigo wanted to be the leader as the world becomes digital, which to me, <coughs> excuse me, sounded very arrogant, but it took me a few years to understand this means we will be the ones pushing the limits. This is the ones taking the risk, not just on the technology, but coming to Drupa with a theater and trying new business models and partnering with small little companies. I remember the direction, interaction with Direct Smile when you wrote your name on the clouds was like, wow, how do you do it? And all these people that had ideas, that's what, what it's mean. You know, for example, today I work with a company called Redefine Meat and our vision is to become the world's biggest meat company. We just started selling last year. We're selling a few million dollars. We have a plan to get to a billion dollars. The big meat companies are tens of billions of dollars. Most of us don't know their names because they don't want to know. They don't want us to know that they're really the guys taking a billion cows on this planet, slaughtering them and shipping them all around the world and creating more waste and CO2 than Japan and the car industry and a lot of things, others together. So this is a big vision. And vision is very important, but, but for me, I, there is something even more fundamental, which is why do we exist? Why do companies exist? And, uh, you know, the original HP, the HP of Bill and Dave, the founders, uh, was a company which was an engineering company. These guys were businessmen. They definitely cared about cash, but they said, and you can read it, but I, I will read this, that many people assume wrongly that a company exists simply to make money, but we have come to the conclusion that a group of people get together and exist as a company so we can accomplish something collectively, which you cannot accomplish separately. They are able to do something worthwhile. They make a contribution to society. I, 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 you know, I don't think anybody could say it better than that. And I don't think the world today actually operates like that, unfortunately. Capitalism in the States sort of changed in the 80s with Milton Friedman and shareholder value. And today people talk about purpose-driven and all these things. At the end, I'll talk about culture in a second. You know very clearly <clears throat> why does a company exist. When you walk into a print company, and I've walked into hundreds and hundreds and you know, dozens of countries, after three or four hours, you feel what the culture is. You feel why the company exists. If it's only about making money, it's very clear. It's about something broader than that. It's also very, uh, very, very clear. So what is culture? Culture is uh, uh, a term to be used for countries, obviously. I think we saw it very much during the COVID. Different cultures reacted differently. Corporate culture is developed through the years. It's not defined. It's not something that's written on the walls. And as I'm sure most of you have heard, a very smart guy said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. I fully believe that, especially in the time of crisis. When you have a strong culture and you go through a crisis, which is inevitable, we had one in 2001, 2008, COVID, etc. you go through. One very smart person once told us in one of the D-Scoop conferences that culture is the stories that employees tell us about the management and the CEO. It's the stories, the back stories. Um, Years later, I will say the opposite of this culture is not what you post about yourself on LinkedIn. You know, this whole culture, social media is great, but the fact you write about yourself, how great you are, and you, that doesn't mean anything. It's what do people post about you, what do people say about you. That's very, very critical. And, and through the years, for me, the, the biggest learning from culture was the interaction with the small indigo users, the family businesses. And I don't have time to go into all of this, but I will tell you that, you know, there's a great book called Humble Leadership, and it def defines a few levels of, uh, of different cultures and levels of trust. 
The first one is like domination. It's almost like slavery, which unfortunately has, has dominated much of European and worldwide history. The level three is this total mutual commitment, which for me is a family business. I mean, you work with companies for 20 years, which is a husband and wife or two brothers or a father and a son or a third generation. There's this total commitment and trust. It doesn't mean there aren't arguments. It doesn't mean there aren't political issues inside the family, but there's this ultimate trust. Um, corporates usually try to work on level one. It's transactional, there's role-based, it's professional, there's bonuses, there's a system. It tries to be fair, it tries to be purpose, but, uh, you know, there's no real commitment. For me, at least in Indigo and the companies I work with today, my goal would be to get to a level three, knowing it's almost impossible. When you're thousands of people around the world, you can't really be a family business, but you can strive to be f uh, family trusting. So it's somewhere between level two and, and level three, and that's you know totally, totally critical. The, the, the book gives a lot of examples, etc. but for me, it's, it's very, very critical. And again, after spending a day with the company and talking not just to the owner, but to the operators and the marketing people and the call center, you, you pretty much get a sense where this culture is. Of course, culture is primarily measured in tough times and not in, not in uh, great times. Once you have the vision and the purpose and the culture, you need to build a team. When you want to be an insurgent, you have to hire people that are willing to think out of the box. You want to hire people that are very, very diverse, that approach problems from different angles. Uh, you have to hire people that are smarter than yourself. This is true not just for technology, because insurgency can be around business models, it could be around customer intimacy. It doesn't have to be only around technology, right? There are many ways of, of being an insurgent. So, so this is very critical. But again, over the years, I, I found that that's not enough. You can have a very, very uh, creative organization, but it never scales, and you don't really know how to deal with the different problems, because at the end, Again, an in, in interesting model that's uh, called Wicked Problems. Again, you can Google it and, and read it. There are three nature of issues to solve. There is a critical problem where you have a problem you need to solve it. There is a tame problem where you need to organize the process. And there is a leadership problem, uh, problem which is called a Wicked Problem, where you really need to ask questions and be a leader. So a uh, uh, critical problem is your indigo press is down, you have to replace a Writing head, you call the expert, they come, they replace the writing head. They solve it. It's like you have a fire, you call the fire department. A tame problem, you have an issue of productivity, you need to run a lean process, you bring a management expert, you have somebody from your operation team, you run a few events, you run the process, you improve. A wicked problem is a lot more than that. It's, it's a change in the environment. It's, it's how to deal with the rise of the internet, how to deal with COVID, how to deal with the change in regulation, with globalization, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's usually no simple answer, but you need leadership, which means not rushing and doing it, not appointing an expert, but having this diverse group of people that ask questions and you make progress. You actually never solve the problem. You just make progress till the next problem. When you have a management team where you have the three different functions, you have the experts, you have the process people, and you have the leaders that can ask the questions and integrate all of it, it's very powerful. And then you're going to make mistakes. You know, Indigo, myself, Simon, we made tons of mistakes, and we tried to learn with them. We tried not to repeat them. We, we launched the first Indigo in 93, 94, placed hundreds of units, almost went bankrupt. It was a learning experience for all of us that were there during this period in humility, in customer intimacy, and in, in the impact of what happens when you do bad for your customers. And then we launched, you know, many years later, the HP Indigo 10,000. <laughs> we made a lot of mistakes. Most of them were new. And uh, we learned from them and we survived. But we did have the customer trust. And all customers told us, you have problems, but we know you're going to solve it. You know you're never going to give up until you solve it. And we solved it. And by the time we launched the Series 5, I think we fix most of these issues. So that's very, very critical, this learning organization. <coughs> so I want to end with sort of how do you stay an insurgent? In this model of, of uh, insurgency and incumbency, the, the notion is you need to keep the founder's mentality. As long as Bill and Dave were running HP 
things really worked well. I mean, they kept the team, they scaled, and, and it was amazing. I wasn't there, but I talked to people who were under them. And they, they sort of embodied this insurgency. They had this bold mission. They were willing to take risks. They thought long term. They spent a lot of time with the labs, with the customers. And they cared. They owned the business. They, they managed the cash flow. And, and all the company operated like that. And this is true for many companies that were founders, including print companies. The question is, what happens when you're acquired by a big company? What happens when the founder moves on? What happens when the father moves on and, and even gives it to the son or daughter? Can you maintain this? And there, and there are all these tips. And, and for me, I've sort of summed up some of the things which I think are, are the most important, but they're obviously open to debate. debate. The first is to build this trusting culture. For me, it's fundamental. Without this, you can't succeed. You can't survive a crisis. And as I've always said, the role of a, of a management team is to think 10 years out, not next quarter, not meeting your numbers. It's to think 10 years out. What's the strategy? What are the macro trends? What are the risks? Where do I want to be in 10 years? And then you have to know, and for me, you have to love your customers. And, and honestly, my, my, my biggest... Uh, uh, enjoyment in, in my years in Indigo is interaction with customers and, and with the team. And I think the Indigo organization in general loved customers, and the customers gave the love back, which was very important. You do that through many ways. So here I'm getting a little bit more tactical. Customer advisory boards, spending days and days and days a year with customers. Simon, myself, Francois, we would meet customers every week, and we would travel abroad because the customers were out of there and we had advisory boards and D-Scoop and, and trade shows, et cetera. We, we, you have to define what you do by yourself and where do you partner. For Indigo, a lot of the things we partnered. We did not do finishing. We did not do workflow, at least in the first few years until Simon came up with PrintOS. So a lot of things you do, we never went into media. We never went into coatings. You build this ecosystem, it's critical. And you have to be curious all the time, and you have to hire curious people. And at the end, if you really want to build a culture, you have to promote people that live and embody this culture, because all the rest is nonsense. If you promote people that don't live the culture because they're talented, because they're good, you've killed the culture. That, at the end, that's what defines the culture. Who do you promote and who do you let go? And in terms of, of making mistakes, you have to learn from the mistakes in a formal way. It's not enough to say, I'll learn. You make a mistake, you finish a Drupa, you issue a very deep analysis of what worked, what didn't work, what needs to be next time. So four years later, you don't start from scratch. You have to be humble and you have to be generous. Uh, when I left Indigo, I, I, I said in my parting speech that I've never regretted being generous. And, and I really think that's true. For, to a customer, to the team, it's the right thing to do. It, it usually pays off. And if it doesn't, you know what, Th that's okay. And you have to have fun. Life is short. And I think, you know, one of the things I, I've seen in this industry is the passion from the customers and how you come and they're proud and they're having fun. It's hard work. They're crises, but they really love it. So I would ask, you know, yourself to ask yourselves, like in Alice in Wonderland, the Caterpillar asked, who are you? So where are you in terms of the culture? What, where do you want to be in terms of your organization? Where are you in terms of you know, insurgency versus bureaucracy versus innovation? At least think about these things. And then also, you know, do you have the right people dealing with the right problems? Do you understand that some problems are critical, some are tame, and some are wicked? We're never going to go solve them, but you need to sort of go ahead and try to uh, do it. And at the end, you know, I, I, I really uh, like these kind of forums because I think it's an opportunity to step back and to exactly talk about 10 years, culture, sustainability, problem solving. Many wicked problems will only be solved by these kind of forums. It will never be solved by a specific company, as big as it is, because there are diverse views. The whole question of sustainability in the print and packaging industry is a wicked problem. We can only solve it by working together. The whole question of manpower, bringing young people into the industry, automation, will only come from solving a wicked problem. We'll never really solve it, but collectively, I, I think we can. And again, I'm sorry I'm going to now sprint to the airport, but uh, I've summed up my life in 20 minutes. I hope it added some value, and I'm really sure you're going to have a great two Brilliant. days. And thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.